be big and be bold and welcome the competition. But more importantly, if you're so badass and you have such great aspirations, then do the things on and off the field to compete. And don't let people come into your backyard, all right, and tell you what to do and show you what to do. And if you can't stop them from coming in, then you better be there with your dukes up ready to fight. And, ha and don't you dare capitulate because that's not the American soccer way. And I say that is not the American way, my friend. Hello, Sunshine. I'm Alexi Lawless, and welcome to the State of the Union podcast, where we look at the beautiful game on and off the field through the lens of red, white, and blue colored glasses. This show will be talking UCL drama, Ingla Fuera, uh, MLS weekend review, MLS soccer schools, rule changes, penalty fights, World Cup grass, and so much more. For first joining me, as always, my friend, my colleague, my guiding light, David Mossy, a soccer savant and a Fox soccer researcher and writer extraordinaire. Mossy, how are you doing on this Wednesday, April 17th in the year 2024? Doing well, still buzzing from these Champions League quarterfinals we just witnessed. Wow, my goodness. Uh, you were torn there for a second because we obviously had a call time here and it came right at the middle of what we're going to talk about here, but you decided to put it on your phone and uh, make your way into work, right? I did, yeah. I think it all worked out. Yeah. H have you watched anything uh, real quick before we get into this? A uh, couple things. On back-to-back -back nights, I made my way to the Arrow Theater in Santa Monica. First... Uh, to watch a screening of a documentary about Steve Martin, which mm. was excellent. He's had a fascinating career. Incredible. Incredible. And then the following night, uh, you know, it was just the 30-year anniversary of Kurt Cobain's suicide. So they showed uh, that documentary that Brett Morgan made a few years ago about him. And Brett Morgan was there for a Q&A afterwards. Uh, so it was an interesting evening. Brett Morgan, who also directed the OJ 30 for 30, June 17, 1994. Wow. Well, you had an eventful uh, couple of days here. My goodness. Yep. Awesome. I didn't do anything like that. Although I did start the um, the Lincoln uh, show. Manhunt. Manhunt. So I know the final one comes out this weekend, so I'm going to time it uh, perfectly because I knew I wasn't going to be able to binge from start to finish. So, so far, yeah, so good. So good. I'm always interested now, and it's obviously because of some historical documentation that they have that Abraham Lincoln is always made to have a very high voice uh, and we've seen it in the past with films. So obviously that is something and then it, it included in this one when that happens. All right, don't bore us, get to the course, right? Should we light this candle? Let's do it. Where should we start? Uh, the UEFA Champions League quarterfinals are in the books after an incredible couple of weeks of action. The semifinals are set. Uh, let's begin on Tuesday of this week. Barcelona hosted PSG. Remember, Barcelona had won 3-2 in Paris last week and they scored first in the second leg through Rafinha. We're playing well in control, and then everything turned on one moment. Barcola threw on goal. Araujo brought him down on the edge of the box. The referee showed Araujo a straight red card, so Barcelona had to play the rest of the match down a man, and they crumbled. Usman Dembele equalized before halftime. Vicinha scored early in the second half, and then Mbappe took care of the rest with a penalty and a left-footed strike. PSG take it 4-1 on the night, 6-4 on aggregate. They're off to the semis for the third time in the last five years, and Barcelona crash out. A couple of comments on this. Uh, number one, I think that uh, Kylian Mbappe has shown why he is. I don't. Even, yeah, I guess it's arguable, but I would put him at the as the best player in the world, and why he is so valuable. Because you know, like the greatest players in the world, when everybody's there waiting for you to do something, he does it. I also maybe I should preface this whole talk that we're going to have about Champions League in that the. Uh, the assessment of coaches, managers that often happens, often happens for the super clubs at this time. And this is why that Super League, you know, while it might not have happened, why there was, I think, a uh, an appeal. Because these are the games, these are the teams, these are the elite teams that you want to see. And when it happens, you are... You are, I guess, more fairly able to judge what teams are, what players are, and ultimately what coaches are. And all these coaches of these big teams, they are, they are ultimately there to get these wins in these types of situations. And, I guess in the case of this game, not get thrown out of the game. Yeah, Xavi was very upset with the red card. I did not have a problem with that decision. I thought the referee officiated a pretty good game. 
but yeah, Xavi completely lost his composure, which doesn't reflect well on him. He got himself tossed. You have something to say on that? Well, I just there are fine lines, and again, this goes back to this, you know, this this high um, standard that we're talking about here, and the margin for error is so is so small. Yet, I think soccer is more equipped than any sport to lose a player. Well, maybe maybe not, but. I think the reaction and the ability to still function as a team when you go down to 10 man in, in soccer, I think is a reflection on who you are as a team and ultimately who you are as a manager and as a coach. I totally agree. Everybody's acting like after that red card, everything that happened was inevitable. It wasn't. They were still up 4-2 on aggregate at home and they could have done a better job of managing that situation and they completely And nobody's imploded. saying it doesn't change the dynamic. Nobody's saying it doesn't get more difficult. But it's not as difficult as I think it's made out to be, especially if you're supposed to be such an elite coach and you're supposed to be such an elite team. On Mbappe, 41 goals in 42 games this season in all competitions. And he's got a shot here at the storybook ending of his PSG career. They won the French Super Cup. They're 10 points clear in Ligue 1. They're in the French Cup final against Lyon. They'll probably win that. And here he is in the semifinals of the Champions League with a very winnable tie to move on to the semis. Uh, that's because Borussia Dortmund will be their opponents, let's go to that next. Uh, they played host to Atletico Madrid this week. Remember, they had lost 2-1 in Spain. They jumped out to a 2-0 lead thanks to goals by Brandt and Matson. And then an own goal by Mats Hummels and Angel Correa made it 2-2 on the night and put Atletico back up on aggregate. But then Fulkrug and Sabitzer scored 4-2 Dortmund on the night, 5-4 on aggregate. They move on to the semis. So here's, here's another example of a team kind of a, a, an unrecognizable Atletico team in that they they let themselves get down. To their credit, they came back. But I thought for, for a team that has prided itself for so many years on being able to recognize the moment, be able to adapt to the moment, yes, to get ugly, but in a practical way, in a pragmatic way, where was this team in the moment when they needed it? Atletico, they've been more expansive this season, more entertaining for neutrals, but not as airtight defensively. And this was a situation where you're right. They could have used the old Atletico. Right. All right. Well, you know, and, and credit to Dortmund. I think both of us picked Atletico to go on to find a way or maybe for Atletico, the old Atletico to show up in the most important moment. It didn't. So you're going to die on this <laughs> new romantic hill, Atletico? Fine, but you're dead. So PSG Dortmund in one semifinal, they met in the group stage. PSG won 2-0 at home, and then it was 1-1 in Germany. Dortmund will host the first leg of this tie. PSG will host the second leg. I like PSG to advance. I like them, and I like them to advance comfortably. Then the other side of the bracket was determined today. Uh, Bayern Munich beat Arsenal 1-0. Joshua Kimmich with the only goal in the second half. That gave Bayern a 3-2 aggregate triumph. So Arsenal are out. Bayern move on to the semis. More Piers Morgan tears, and that's always a good thing. Um, and this Arsenal team, after what happened on the weekend, you thought, okay, well, they'll, they'll get it together here. Well, some people thought that. But this Bayern Munich team where all the eggs are in this basket, I mean, first off, how do you let Kimmich get so wide open for such a long time and then just basically come in, blow kisses to the girls in the stands, and then smash home a header like that? It's... It, it, I don't understand how, how that happened, but I do understand how Bayern Munich, which, while it doesn't reflect in the, in, the, uh, in the league this year, is still a quality team. And they had injuries, and they were able to overcome that. Bayern will face Real Madrid, who advanced at the expense of Manchester City. The first leg in Spain had finished 3-3. It was 1-1 at the Etihad. Rodrigo scored early for Real Madrid, who then held on for dear life. Kevin De Bruyne did get an equalizer uh, in the 76th minute. Uh, but I was very surprised that City didn't push on and get another to win the game. Real Madrid managed to get this to penalties and then they prevailed 4-3 on penalties. So they move on. The defending champions, Manchester City, are out. We could do shows and shows on penalties and the mentality. I, I, we were watching it here in the studio together and listening to you talk about you know, things that don't even necessarily have to do with kicking the ball or the X's and O's. It's the feel of the game. It's the spirit of the game. I guess to, to use a phrase that we've used often here in the last couple of weeks, it's the romance of the game. You tend to fall on the side of the team that I guess had the worst 120 minutes uh, or, or uh, what is it? Uh, yeah, 120 minutes there um, as opposed to the team that had it in their hand. In this case, it would be City that 
by all counts, deserved to win that game. And Real Madrid, like you said, just hung on. Yeah, I always think the team that's happier to be in a shootout has a psychological edge versus the team that's sitting there thinking, how on earth are we having to go to penalties right now based on what happened in the 120 minutes? And look, if you are going to go down the middle, which is certainly a way to go, and often, not often, but almost all the time that you go down the middle, <laughs> it works. Until that moment when you go down the middle and it doesn't work. Yeah, you're talking about Bernardo Silva, who had an awful penalty saved by Lunin. Lunin is an incredible story, by the way, because Courtois got injured at the start of the season. Real Madrid went out and got Kepa with the thinking that he was going to be the starter, but Lunin outplayed him to such a degree that Ancelotti had no choice but to go with Lunin, who's essentially the third string. And yet, here he is, the hero against Manchester City in a Champions League quarterfinal. He's done very well. Uh, well, I mean, your theory uh, worked out ultimately in the end in terms of the penalties, but what that means is that there is not a EPL team in, uh, in the semifinals, let alone the finals. Correct. So we're left with one Spanish team, one French team, and two Germans. All of a sudden, this has turned into a pretty satisfying season for the Bundesliga when you see what Leverkusen are doing, and they might win the Europa League, and then you have two German teams in the semis. Incidentally, uh, this week's results were such that we now know the 12 European teams that will take part in next year's expanded Club World Cup. They are, they are as follows. Manchester City, Chelsea, Real Madrid, Atletico Madrid... Bayern, Borussia Dortmund, PSG, Inter, Juventus, Benfica, Porto, and Salzburg. So no Arsenal? No Arsenal, no Liverpool, no Manchester United, no Barcelona. There's some heavy hitters missing out. Oh, we need to work on that. We need to talk to, <laughs> to, talk to Johnny. That's, that's, that's not going to fly here. We, <laughs> we need all guns when it comes to the, uh, the Club World Cup next summer. But yeah, so the other semifinal, it's the latest chapter in a storied rivalry. Bayern Munich and Real Madrid have faced off a million times in this competition. Bayern will host the first leg. Real Madrid will host the second leg. I lean Real Madrid. Bayern first and then Real Madrid. Really? Yes. I'm, I'm sticking with my uh, Germans. This is the, the year of the Germans, like you said. You might be right. If it ends up being my way, Real Madrid versus PSG at Wembley in the final with the whole Mbappe oh, subplot, that would be incredible. Yes. I kind of, yeah, I kind of want to watch. I kind of want to watch that. that. That would be kind of cool. All right. Well, it's all set up. Anything else uh, you want to hit here? Yes. We're taping this on a Wednesday. Tomorrow we have the Europa League quarterfinal second legs. Uh, Storylines abound. We'll see if Atalanta can finish off Liverpool. They have a 3 0 lead. We'll see if Leverkusen can finish off West Ham and stay unbeaten in all competitions. And we'll see if AC Milan can go to Rome and overturn a 1 0 deficit against Roma. But before we move on, I also I, I just love listening to you because sometimes you say things uh, that you don't even know are, are, are incredible and are at the very least interesting. But you re reiterated what I think we both agree and what I think a lot of people out there agree. What's the best moment in sports or what's the best thing in sports? Penalty shootouts. Absolutely. There is nothing that is better in terms of drama. It is simple, easily understood, easily digestible, whether you are a huge soccer fan or have never watched the game before, you can understand exactly what is happening. So much so that as a neutral, when it goes after the 90 minutes and the 215s, I don't want anybody to score. As a matter of fact, I want them to go straight to penalties, but if they <laughs> actually are having to play the 215s, I don't want anybody to score because I want that drama. I want that gift. I want that reward at the end that is the penalties. Well, we were we were given that gift and that reward today. Yep. Uh, right. Speaking of AC Milan, who I mentioned have Europa League activity against Roma tomorrow. Next up in league play for them on Monday, they will face Inter Milan in the derby. This is first versus second, but there's a 14-point gap between the two teams. If Inter win this game, they clinch the Serie A title. I think Inter wins this game. I but agree. even if they don't, like you said, I mean, it's... It's done. Uh, the Premier League aside, we don't have a lot of great title races in Europe this season. We know Leverkusen have already clinched. Inter can clinch here with five matches to spare. PSV can clinch in their next league game, which is next week, by the way, not this week. I screwed that up. Shout out to Kyla for being all over that. Yep. Um, and then another team that's closing in on a league title is Real Madrid. We'll go there next. On Sunday, they will host Re uh, Barcelona in the Clasico. Uh, Real Madrid, eight points clear. So with a win, they can not officially, but effectively secure the title. Frankly, even a draw does it. I think Barcelona need to win this game to give themselves any chance. Not happening. So Not you, happening. you see Real Madrid pushing on now. Incredible exertions here, 120 minutes. Man. Barcelona played a day earlier. Nevertheless, you favor Real Man. Madrid at home. They're Real Madrid have beaten them twice already this season. 2-1 in league play. Jude Bellingham scored twice in that one. And then 4-1 in the Super Cup. Vinicius got a hat trick in that one. You think they'll make it three wins out of three against Barcelona this season. And like I said, effectively secure the La Liga title. Yep. Uh, we go to England next. 
Uh, we know we have a great uh, title race there. Uh, Arsenal and Liverpool both with tricky away games this weekend. Arsenal away to Wolves, Liverpool away to Fulham. City don't play in the Premier League this weekend. We'll tell you why in a minute, but what do you see with Arsenal and Liverpool? When you say they're tricky in that, what, there are 11 men that they are going to face, and so therefore with the small margin right now, any step up would give it to Man City. I mean, because these are games, last week we talked about the fact that it was much more of a fait accompli. And as I talked about earlier, there are certain games where the opposition for your Liverpools and your Arsenals and your Man City are such where it's a better judgment and more fair judgment of actually who they are. And really the only time that we judge them. So wh why do you say these are uh, difficult games? Because I think Wolves and Fulham are pretty good teams. Okay. So the, the possibility of them losing yes. exists. The interesting thing about the Fulham-Liverpool game is Anthony Robinson has been linked with a summer move to Liverpool. So yep. this could be an audition of sorts for him. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just saying that if and when Arsenal and Liverpool win these games, the way that we analyze whether it's Arteta or Klopp or these teams in that moment is minimal compared to when they actually face somebody of their level. Uh, back to Anthony Robinson for a second. You completely ignored the point yeah. I just made. Uh, he's been linked to the likes of Liverpool and Manchester City. He's going to have an interesting dilemma this summer. Does he go to a team like that where he risks being a backup or does he stay at Fulham where we know he's a week-in, week-out starter? Gee, I feel so bad for him, honestly. Is the he going to be able to make this decision? The other, guy, this okay? the other guy that has an interesting decision to make is Serginho Dest uh, because he's on loan at PSV. They want to sign him permanently. But with Xavi leaving, does he want to take another crack at Barcelona? Or is he happy to stay where he's at, a place where he knows he's going to play every week? Well, tough call there. It is. I, I'm being a little flipped when it comes, especially you know the way we talk on this show about looking through things uh, with a red, white, and blue colored lens. So... When it comes to Jedi, yes, I think we all as, as U.S. men's national team fans and relative to the U.S. men's national team want him to go to that next level, whatever that may be. But again, if he's just sitting on the bench, I think for him in particular, that, that is problematic. And, but I, you know, so if he says, no, that's a bridge too far right now, or I just don't see it happening for whatever number of reasons, either he doesn't think he's that good, or the competition is such, or he doesn't like the coach, or just the, the situation that's there. I would hope that him and whoever represents him are getting together and making an educated choice to put him in the best possible position, um, all things being equal. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's, look, this is life-changing, family-changing, gener generationally changing money and a situation that I'm giving, and you kind of have to just do it and let the chips fall where they may. Uh, the reason Manchester City are not playing in the Premier League this weekend is because they're involved in the FA Cup semifinals. They will face Chelsea, while the other semifinal is Haji Wright and Coventry taking on Manchester United. Yeah, I think this is set up for a Manchester City-Manchester United uh, final. So that would not, I mean, yeah, I, th I think that even with what Manchester United is, I still think that they get past Coventry, and I think ultimately Man City find a way past Chelsea. And uh, Erlen Holland obviously didn't play the entire game today, so they got plenty of opportunities. That was interesting. He was subbed out after regulation before the extra time. Julian Alvarez coming on for him. So uh, that was a big call by Pep. That's you know why he gets the big money, and that's why he's going to be questioned right now because uh, they're fuera. I agree with you. I think we're headed for the second straight year for a Manchester Derby in the final. I will say Chelsea are playing better. We did get an Ask Alexi question about that whole penalty Mishagaz in their game against Everton on Monday, so we'll revisit Chelsea down there. And as far as games that you want to see from a neutral perspective, I'd rather see the two Man Manchester teams play. You know? what, but what and about the Haji Wright, Wright fact? It's okay. It's great. It's fine. But, but no, I'd still rather see the other one. Haji Wright is Haji Wright, whether he plays in the final or not. So I'd be happy for him. And as an American, I'd be happy that Americans playing in the final. But bigger picture, I don't want to see Coventry play against Man City. I Fair want enough. to see Manchester United play against Man City. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, uh, we'll flip it stateside. Okay, welcome back. Let's take a look at what's happening over here in the, the United States and Canada, for that matter. When it comes to Major League Soccer, we've got an interesting slate this weekend. Uh, where do you want to start here, Mossy? Uh, Inter-Miami will host Nashville. Inter-Miami level on points atop the East. Nashville near the bottom of the standings. 
These two teams with a lot of recent history. They met in the League's Cup final last year, Inter-Miami prevailing on penalties, and they met in the round of 16 of this year's CONCACAF Champions Cup, Inter-Miami moving on 5-3 on aggregate. They meet an MLS play this upcoming weekend. Yeah, it has not gone well for Nashville this season. However, when you look at the, the standings, with one win, they can catapult right up to that line, that line of demarcation between making the playoffs and not making the playoffs that we oftentimes fairly or not use to differentiate between success and failure. So this, a desperate Nashville will be very, very interesting uh, coming up against the number one team in Major League Soccer uh, that is Miami right now. Uh, any any word if Messi's going to play? He, he's, he, I would assume so, and he's coming off that great performance at yep. Arrowhead against SKC. Yep, all right, all right. Well, I'm, I'm still, I'm gonna go with Messi and company here. Yep, and Nashville's woes continue. Also on Saturday, LAFC will face the Red Bulls. The Red Bulls level on points with Inter-Miami atop the Eastern Conference standings. Yeah, I mean, we talked about the Red Bulls and this, uh, rejuvenation this year and it's it's fun it's interesting and i think a lot of people are just are caveat okay yes but is this going to uh is this going to last you know cross-country trip never easy for any team uh and playing a good team like uh, lafc i think that lafc is starting to feel it um, and whether they're feeling it in the moment or whether they're feeling it also relative to the summer that's coming where i think some changes are going to be made I think that LAFC has turned a corner. Uh, home team again on this one, LAFC. This is LA versus New York. Your musical tastes have been a theme on this pod mm. recently. Uh, Tupac or Biggie, do you have a preference there? I, I cannot name a single song by either one of them. I know that's sacrilege in, in certain circles. Um, but, okay, uh, it would probably be... I, when I think of Biggie, I did see the uh, documentary on him, which was very, very good and his relationship with his mom and everything. And uh, so I, I liked that. And I liked the, so I don't know, I'd have to, you know what I'm gonna do? I will, I will promise you this. I will go and listen, not to the entire catalogs, but to selective uh, songs, if you will. And I will come back to you in the evergreen debate between Biggie and Tupac. And I will give you my final say as to who comes out on top. I forgot to ask you at the top of the show, Kurt Cobain, Nirvana, grunge. It's, it's a little, it, it lacks in, le, in melody and pop for me. So it's the anti-melody type of stuff that kind of drives me a little crazy on it. Some of it can be good, and when it's good, it can be really good. Uh, back to MLS, we have an FS1 doubleheader on Sunday. Charlotte will host Minnesota. Minnesota once again dealing with Emmanuel Reynoso drama, another unauthorized trip to Argentina. He misses green card uh, meeting. You know, last year the fans stood behind him, behind him, but this year it sounds like they've changed their tune on that. They want Minnesota to unload him, which is a shame. One of the most talented players in the league. Undeniably talented, to your point, Mossy. And this is, again, professional sports. And you will put up with a lot in order to win soccer games. However, in my professional opinion, you need the actual athletes on the field in order to win said games. And this continues to be a problem. They thought they had gotten through it. And there comes a point where this is Reynoso. This is not Messi. So I think Minnesota has bent over backwards to accommodate this player. And I think it's come to the point where it's not good for him. It's not certainly not good for Minnesota. And you, you know, Fisher cut bait. You got to you got to cut bait because this is this is frustrating. I would think if I was a player in that locker room, I'd say, "You know what? You may have problems, which is all fine and well. We all have different problems, but if you can't deal with them, you're f***ing up my world." Okay? And as an athlete, that ruthlessness is important, especially professional athletes. They want to win. And as I said before, they will forgive, they will forget, they will compartmentalize in order to win. But if and when what you are doing is messing up their ability to be successful, which by the way, is their livelihood, adios. All right. Also on Sunday on FS1, the Galaxy will host San Jose. The Galaxy first in the West, San Jose dead last. Kobe Jones still rides for this as the best rivalry in Major League Soccer. I mean, it, it can be the best rivalry. In the past, at different times, it was. And I'm not saying that there can't be this spike of, I guess, what would be quality and talent when it comes to San Jose. But these are 
two OG clubs that are in completely different worlds right now when it comes to how good they are. So if the Los Angeles Galaxy can't find a way, even with San Jose getting up for this, as you know, Kobe has alluded to, historic type of rivalry, then there's a problem with the Galaxy. But I don't think there's a problem with the Galaxy. I think that they take this, I think they take it easily. Uh, two miscellaneous stories we want to hit. The first involving San Diego FC. I know you have some thoughts on them. Yeah, I mean, they, uh, they came out today with uh, some news that they are having the MLS's first residential academy with an integrated 6 through 12 school uh, when they come into the league next year. And, and it's interesting. Uh, MLS teams, obviously, with the, you know, the focus on youth development uh, over the years and a lot of money and resources have, that have been put into it. Uh, many uh, teams out there have incorporated an educational part of it. Um, but this is an actual residential type of academy. We've seen this in the past. I think this is a really interesting and potentially um, impactful type of change. I don't know how many other teams are going to do it because it certainly brings other challenges out there. But this is essentially your, your school where, let's be honest, it's not like other schools. The priority is still soccer with the recognition and the respect that integrating the scholastic part and the academic part in is important and maybe will entice others from the outside. Uh, having, having them residential, that's a whole nother level of responsibility. And I would just say this, that responsibility goes beyond producing good soccer players. And so whether it's San Diego or any place else, I think if you ever abdicate that responsibility, then shame on you. So I hope that this goes well, and I hope that this gives a holistic type of approach to the development of young soccer players. But in doing so, I hope it concentrates just as much on that other 22 and a half hours that it does on that 90 minutes on the field. But we'll see ultimately what it looks like, the realities, the good, the bad, the challenges, and they're going to have some. some. And it certainly, I would hope, as it continues to grow, gets better and better. And they very quickly fix whatever problems and challenges that they, uh, that they encounter because it's a whole different animal when it becomes a residential academy. Uh, the other story, which I hope we can use as a jumping off point for a larger conversation, involves this relevant lawsuit. Um, they are a company that wants to stage competitive European club matches here in the United States. MLS and U.S. soccer are opposed to that. And so it led to an antitrust lawsuit. And FIFA had initially taken U.S. soccer side on that and were part of the lawsuit. And now they no longer are. It sounds like they've changed their tune and would be fine with this. So it's just U.S. soccer fighting against it. And most people seem to think the momentum is moving towards it happening. And this dovetails with the Wrexham story we talked about the other day. Also, NBC recently had one of those uh, Premier League fan fests in Nashville. There were thousands of Americans wearing... Yep. Premier League clubs jerseys and a lot of MLS fans were salty about that. They wondered why don't those people support MLS clubs? So uh, it has me thinking about this question of the growth of MLS versus the growth of soccer as a whole in this country. And when those two things aren't necessarily directly aligned, how do you reconcile that? Well, I do think that they're aligned in that if you look at the growth of Major League Soccer, it does mirror the explosion, the growth. I mean, this is a league that was birthed out of 1994 and the World Cup. To your point, this should not, this should not surprise anybody. Uh, and I've said this time and time again, MLS's problem isn't that there aren't soccer fans in the United States. As a matter of fact, to your point, there continue to be more and more soccer fans. It's that there's not enough MLS fans. And that has been, from day one, the challenge that MLS has had to face in how to either develop them birth them or convert them. And sure, you would like them all to come into the MLS tent, but at the very least, you'd like them to straddle that tent, having their affiliations that you saw in Nashville and other places with these uh, clubs around the world, but also having their local MLS team. And, and I can sp spread it out also to apply to USL and NWSL uh, uh, going forward. But you know, this, this is going to continue to be a challenge. And it should not surprise MLS or anybody that this has happened because this is who we are. And because we did not have a robust professional ecosystem that existed out there, 
people and generations have looked elsewhere. And when they, either rightly or wrong, fair or not, equate it with credibility and authenticity and being genuine in terms of what soccer is and all of that baggage that we talk about here on the show, it doesn't change the fact that people are into it. Um, I don't have the answer. I know you don't necessarily have the answer. This is the fight. And this is the challenge for anybody that gets involved with professional soccer. And you certainly can't ignore it or be oblivious to it. But I'm not sure there is a good, solid answer that is that magic bullet that changes it on a dime. I think it's just a matter of working and showing time and time again that you measure up either on the field or off the field in terms of the experience. Let me ask you a hypothetical question. Yeah. If you have a friend who hates soccer, makes fun of it, it's a dumb sport, and then they take a trip to England, they attend an Arsenal-Liverpool Premier League game, love it, come back and say, I was wrong, soccer is great, I'm going to become a fan now, but I want to watch the best, so I'm going to become a Premier League fan, not MLS. Are you annoyed at that, or is that a win? Hey, it's one more soccer fan in this country that didn't exist before. Yeah, I would rather you be a soccer fan than not a soccer fan. I mean, that's that's obvious, but you ever heard the, the, the you know, the, the, uh, the folks that go to uh, Ireland and they drink Guinness and they come back talking about how, how awesome the Guinness is? I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like that. And there is almost an infection that happens to some of the people that we're talking about here. So much so that that infection produces a defense that they have the inability to see anything that is possibly something that they would like because they see it as less credible, obviously not genuine, less authentic. And that whole snobbery that comes with it, that is very difficult to penetrate once it has <laughs> infiltrated the system and infected you. Two examples in our control room right now, Sean Sullivan, a Bologna fan and Jack, a Roma fan. Why aren't they supporting MLS teams? Hey, listen, I, I, think, they both, I think they both recognize that MLS is a part of their soccer spectrum. But going, let's take it back full circle to what's going on on here. As you know, I am a fan of competition, but if I'm MLS, I don't want to make it easy for people to come into our backyard and to take over market share and to convert just Americans in general to insert your team, Chelsea or Arsenal or, or, or Real Madrid. But they see gold in our hills. And I don't blame them for wanting to do it. Ultimately, when it comes to what the law is going to say, it might fall one way or the other. And if it falls one way where they are able to have games and possibly meaningful games within, that, within the league that just ups the ante, yeah, that's going, to be prob that's going to be problematic. So you know what? If you're MLS, again, it goes back to what we said before. Be big and be bold. And welcome the competition. But more importantly, if you're so badass and you have such great aspirations, then do the things on and off the field to compete. And don't let people come into your backyard, all right, and tell you what to do and show you what to do. And if you can't stop them from coming in, then you better be there with your dukes up ready to fight. And, and don't you dare capitulate because that's not the American soccer way. And I say that is not the American way, my friend. And we mentioned this in the first segment, the expanded Club World Cup next summer is going to expose a lot of American fans to European clubs in competitive matches, including against MLS teams, potentially. Imagine if MLS gets its clock clean in those games. That's not going to be a good look. It's not good, but I will finally, finally say this and then we can move on. If and when you are able to convince somebody that is a snob about their soccer and talks about, you know, the, the team over wherever it is that they, that they support, <laughs> you know, and takes on all of the, you know, the different words and jargons in order to, to look cool. If and when those people actually do go to an MLS game or become an MLS fan, not all the time, but more often than not, when they are exposed to it, they actually have fun and they see that it's in their backyard. And I think the best ones are able to separate out the two and understand they might be different experiences, but they both can be fun and they both can be something that they can grab onto. And the best part about American soccer fans out there is the fact that they think globally, is the fact that they understand that there is soccer going on all over the world. And crapping on one 
team or league or country or culture just means that you have less soccer in your life. And I'm of the opinion that you need more soccer in your life, whether that's in your backyard or whether that's overseas. That is it. All right, let's take another quick break. When we come back, it's time for Ask Alexi. Okay, welcome back. It's time for Ask Alexi, that part of the show where you send in your comments, questions, and concerns. And you can use that hashtag, Ask Alexi, on all the different uh, different social media platforms out there. And keep in mind that our handle is SOTU with Alexi on the social media platforms. Or you can call our State of the Union podcast hotline, which is 657-549-2297. That's 657-549-2297. Mossy, what do the folks want to know today? Uh, first up, Colin on X uh, says... I'm taking the PK. And what he's <laughs> alluding to is, as we were taping on Monday, Chelsea hammered Everton 6-0. Cole Palmer, by the way, another excellent young English player who we're going to get to watch at the Euros. He scored four goals in that match. He's having an incredible season. Uh, but even in what was a rare good day for Chelsea, they still managed to embarrass themselves because they earned the penalty in the second half of this game. And this argument broke out between Cole Palmer and Nicholas Jackson over who would take it. Uh, it was pretty bizarre. Pochettino said afterwards it was unacceptable. They acted like children. He was embarrassed by it. And so, uh, Colin, bringing that up to us, uh, in all your days playing, uh, can you ever remember a similar dispute over a penalty? Uh, I can't remember a specific example, but I will say that if and when Eric, Winal playing for the national team, if and when Eric Winaldo was on the field, there was only one person that was going to take it. And he was very good at it. So I think anybody felt good giving him the ball. Although... The great Joe Max Moore, who I've talked about before, the most competitive human being I have ever played anything against, and he would want to win in anything. If and when there was a penalty, he would be the one to fight Eric or anybody for it. And I vividly remember over the ball these conversations happening. And his was much more in a, no, you got to let me have this. No, And it didn't register for him that anybody else could possibly do this. And that's why, that's why I loved Joe Max, uh, Joe Max Moore. It never rose to what we saw on the field here. You know, people screaming and yelling, pushing and shoving, doing all that kind of stuff. It's a bad look for the players involved. It's a bad look for your team. As we know, the penalty t kick takers are usually in advanced, sometimes up on the board, and at the very least talked to as to who it is. And you, if you're especially at a club team, over the course of a season, you know who, who they are that are going to take it. And you want somebody that's going to actually step up and score it. The interesting thing is from a, a manager, coach perspective, while you might designate somebody, there's a part of you that also wants in that moment to be reactive and to have the person that's feeling it at that moment take it. But if in that moment that person was not your designated player, it can get it can get ugly. Well, it shouldn't get ugly, but it can get ugly. And this was an embarrassment, especially in a game like this. What, it, the, ga the game was over. You're going to score. You, whether you score or not, the game wasn't going to change. If this is a do or die type of situations where emotions are, are laid bare, I can understand it a little bit more. But it's still, I would probably get back into the locker room and say, what the hell are you guys doing? You look stupid. And... By association, you're making me look stupid. Don't ever make me look stupid. Now, this would never happen in MLS. Do you know why? Why is that? Because all the players have been made aware that you don't count penalty kick goals in your MVP criteria. That's true. Exactly. Uh, I would say the, the, someone would actually gladly, go ahead, you could take it. It's not going to matter to me. So in, in Alexi's eyes. We talked about penalty shootouts. We had one with uh, Manchester City and Real Madrid yep. today. What about in shootouts? Would you be the one to ask to take it or would you be hiding behind a teammate? I was just never asked to take it. I would have taken it if they wanted. And I guess if I, I, I wasn't involved in hardly any. I play. vaguely remember 95 Copa America against Mexico. Yeah, I didn't take it. I think, I don't remember who took it on that. I was not involved. I will tell you that I did take one shootout, the old 35-yard shootout back in MLS, back in the uh, first couple of years of the, uh, the league. I took one. I think it was in D.C. against D.C. United. Not only did I take it, but I rounded the goalkeeper and then slotted it. Well done. 100%. Yep. When we go back to uh, the 35-yard shootout, shootout, which we should do. Um, and I did miss a penalty in uh, a Michigan high school or uh, youth, whatever, uh, travel team, whatever, league. So, yeah. 
Uh, next up, Ty Kobe, also on X, suggests a couple of rule changes. Uh, he asks, what would it change if a sub break was two minutes with quick coaching meeting? And what about challenge flags for coaches? Yeah, the first one is essentially timeouts. How would you feel if we added timeouts in soccer? And the second one, I've thought about that with the challenge flags, but let's address the first one first. Yeah, so the timeouts. You know, I will say the the advent of the hydration break, which amounts to a, a, a timeout, uh, even though it's it's mandatory in this situation, I think you would you could call it so there'd be more a, stri- a strategy involved in it. You know the stoppage of a game in that moment. I I don't think it is as um, you know important or messes up the game as much as maybe others do. I just a sub break with two minutes of quick coaching meeting. One of the things that I love about the game and have since I first ever kicked the ball was that you are left to your own devices. And I'll, I'll just say this. When I watch on television or when you watch us on television, we're all trying to get into the psyche and the X's and O's and the reasons for what, why things are happening out there. But the reality is players will talk all the time about, yeah, this is the strategy and coaches will talk about the time. That whistle blows and that autonomy, there is nothing like it. That freedom to do whatever you want, even at the expense. Actually, I was watching uh, Thierry Henry the other day in a a moment of clarity. And I think uh, honesty, he actually was talking about a moment where while the coach might be saying, do this, no, you're on the field, you're in charge, you have the ball and you have the freedom to do whatever it is. Yeah, it might come at the expense of if you do something that your coach doesn't want you to do, fine. But I love the fact that you can do that. And more often than not, players do what they feel. They, they do whatever it is that they ultimately want to do. And I, I, I like that. And I don't want coaching and timeouts that involve coaching to become the norm. Because I do think that that fundamentally changes the way the game is played and certainly the way the game is coached. The second one is challenge flags. People complain about VAR intruding on the game too much. So why not put it on the coaches like we do with the NFL? And it's left up to their discretion if they think a play is important enough to be reviewed. How do you feel about that? Because the whole point of VAR was to, quote, get the call right and use the technology available to, more often than not, with the added advantage that the technology brings, to get what even at times is a subjective call, quote, unquote, right. And in this instance, what you're going to be left with is because you don't have a timeout or because you don't, not a timeout, a a flag to throw, and you can't stop the game, that you're not going to get the call right. And I don't, especially in a game that is so low scoring, I think you just, you're going to get into trouble from doing that. On the topic of rules changes, MLS had three initiatives they were planning to introduce at the start of the season, but because we had replacement officials, they held off on it, and now they're going to implement it this upcoming weekend. They are as follows. Injured players who are down for 15 seconds must leave the pitch for two minutes. Sub players have 10 seconds to leave. Otherwise, a new player must wait a minute to enter, which means you play with 10 for a minute. And then in-stadium VAR announcements. I love them. I love them all. Now, you know, the devil is in the details in how they are going to be officiated. I mean, because we're dealing now with seconds. And are they are they the six second type of uh, wishy-washy type of thing? Or is there, you know, an actual clock that's going? And are players and coaches on the sideline going to be doing the whole one, two, three, four type of thing to make sure that everybody in the stadium under, understands if and when somebody doesn't leave in the allotted time? Um, so this is going to be fascinating to see. I, my initial reaction is that's great. And Rob Stone, we know, is very, very happy because there's. N- if you ever want to see Rob Stone just lose his mind, it's when a player takes too much time to get off the field. Uh, and it drives him absolutely bat- crazy. The in-stadium VAR announcements, I think that's great to make sure that people understand what is going on. And some people are going to be good at it. Some people aren't. Some people are better at public, uh, public speaking than others. Um, and actually... I think the personality of these referees, if they play it right, I think it can be enhanced and they can actually protect themselves in a way by 
explaining to people what is going on in these little moments of VAR clarity? I think the last two are no-brainers, the sub leaving after 10 seconds and the in-stadium VAR announcement. The first one, there's at least some room for debate. Again, like you said, we'll see how it's actually implemented, but uh, some people think it's overly cynical. A guy might legitimately be shaken up and it might take him more than 15 seconds to gather himself, but then he has to leave the field for two minutes. You're essentially punishing a player for getting tackled to the ground. I, I don't know. Do you, do you think that they're assuming if it takes more than 15 seconds, it must be time-wasting when that's not always the case? Yeah, I and this goes, you know, goes to we never diagnosing something on the field, and and I can't tell you what pain is. I can only tell you what my pain is. <laughs> and so, have you ever gone to a, the doctor and they say, "Hey, give me a uh, a number on the pain scale," and they'll go, you know, ten's the worst, one's the one's the the best uh, or the least amount of pain. And I always was wondering, like, well, my five might be a different five for you uh, going forward. So yeah, I, I I understand that, but I think. There's no one to blame but the players, and I guess all of us in the game, because this is a direct reaction to what the game has become. And if you don't want that, then you shouldn't have done it for years and years and years. Um, and so I think it's just, you know, it, it, there might be moments to your point where it, it is punitive in a way that it wasn't intended, but all in all, I think it's going to be better. On the topic of Rob Stone. Yeah. I went to the Barnes & Noble at the Grove this past weekend, and there was a wrestler there, some girl named Becky Lynch, and there was a line out the door to take pictures with her. I texted Rob Stone, who loves wrestling. He was very excited oh, about it. my God. So that's a bookstore, right? Yes. Wow. Those are things that are still around, huh? Uh, anything else from an Ask Alexi perspective? That is it. That's it. Um, okay, listen, let's go right into the end of our show. And at the end of each and every show, I give you my one for the road. I am a sucker and a nerd, Mossy, when it comes to grass. I, I love thinking and talking about what grass is, what grass could be, especially and in particular when it relates to the World Cup. For those that remember, way back in the previous century, back in the 1900s, back in the summer of 1994, we had a World Cup. The Pontiac Silverdome out there, a couple minutes from where I grew up, was one of the venues. This was an indoor venue. This was also a venue that had, you know, back then we called it AstroTurf, but synthetic surface, and therefore it, grass needed to be brought in. A wonderful um, group uh, got in touch and was led by the folks over there in uh, Michigan State, and this tray system was made. It was incredible. Because this wasn't what oftentimes happens in these venues where it's just kind of rolled on, laid over grass. These were actual pallets, trays, that were put together, almost at like a, a jigsaw puzzle, that grew together and were rolled in. And the field was wonderful. They did an incredible job. All of the organizers and the, the folks from Michigan State uh, did a wonderful job. We come to find out, uh, and if you look uh, to our friend Doug McIntyre out there, he wrote a wonderful little article talking about what's going to happen in 26, because we've talked about a lot of the indoor venues that we have and a lot of the synthetic, synthetic surfaces that are going to exist uh, leading up to the World Cup that obviously are going to have to be changed and what they are going to do. And evidently, they have partnered once again with the folks at Michigan State and the folks over there at uh, Tennessee, right, uh, uh, Producer Sean? Is that what they're called? The Vols over there? Is that what they're called? Wow. All right. Well, so they partnered with them, and I'm really excited. There ends up being, Mossy, a legacy when it comes to this grass. Uh, for those that uh, are just listening, I will describe the picture that we're going to put up right now. As I said, back in 94, the grass was put into the Silverdome. But what happened to the grass when it was done? Well, what they did was they actually planted it in a aisle, little aisle that's, that exists outside of downtown Detroit called Bell Isle. And they put the grass out there and it actually grows. And I have a picture of myself years later going back and visiting the actual grass that continued to grow through the seasons out there on Bell Isle uh, that I played in the Silverdome in the World Cup. And that same grass that exists in 2026 in all of these different venues that the folks in Tennessee and the folks up at Michigan State are going to develop along with FIFA. 
it will become iconic. It will probably live, literally live on in other places going forward. And in all the different stories and all the different narratives that are out there when it comes to 2026, and there will be a lot of them on and off the field, the story about how the grass comes together, how the research and development happened, because obviously many decades later, uh, the folks that deal with this day in and day out uh, have the technology that is obviously grown dramatically since then. So whether it's an, another type of tray system and certainly the next level when it comes to growing that grass together, it's going to be fascinating to see what they look like and the technology that is used, the technology that comes out, the establishment of true grass and how it is used in some of these venues that we know are synthetic, including venues that will be indoor. And once again, for the first time since 1994, we'll have indoor venues with actual grass on the field. It's going to be fascinating to watch and the stories that people are going to tell as to how it came to be when those players, including the U.S., finally walk out there on that field. Uh, Kat also went to Tennessee, by the way. That's where she met Sean. Really? Yes. I mean, no, they, the Tennessee people, they are, they are incredible. When they start talking about Tennessee, both a, you know, as a university and just as a state, they do not stop. I mean, it's... And it's a hot place to go, like hot in terms of a lot of people are moving there. They, they, they like it over there. On it's the fun. Every time I go there, I have a good time. On the topic of grass, we recently covered the Monterey Inter-Miami CONCACAF Champions Cup game. And that field was a disaster. That's a World Cup venue, the Stadio BBVA. So hopefully they improve that grass between now and 2026. Yeah, and that's, that's normal grass. So they got to figure out a way to, yeah. to get that going. And FIFA does not, FIFA does not suffer fools. Uh, obviously, they're making grass get in there and they're making people pay. And by the way, in a lot of these stadiums, they're going up and out when it comes to the grass. So whether it's down there in Mexico or up there in, uh, in Canada, they better get their you-know-what together and, uh, and figure it out going forward. Anything before we go, my friend? Well, this concludes one of our shortest pods ever. Analytics Allison is going to be very happy. Our completion rate should be very high today. That's right. Uh, for those that don't know what Masi is talking about, we've been told and we have incredible minds out there that have told us that when it comes to the length of the State of the Union, uh, right about an hour, right about an hour is the sweet spot, and certainly less than an hour is what they're what they're hoping for. But sometimes we get talking, and it's, there's no stoppings. So, uh, so enjoy this short State of the Union. Continue to uh, to subscribe and download and rate and do all the different things. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Uh, enjoy your soccer on and off the field. We'll talk to you again next week. And until then, and as always, my friends, size the day.